Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on the quantitative methodology chapter. And just before we start today, um, I'd like to present this information in case you are interested in additional services outside of this webinar. So we do provide uh, assistance in all areas of the dissertation process. And if you are interested in additional one-on-one -on -one help outside of this webinar, you can use this information to contact us and learn more about the types of assistance and services that we provide. Before we get into the presentation, I'd just like to give an overview of what we will be covering today. So we're going to be going over the components of the quantitative methodology chapter. So this is for specifically for quantitative studies. So we won't be discussing qualitative studies today. And we'll start by discussing the purpose of the methodology chapter, and then we will talk about the different components that are typically required in the quantitative methodology chapter, which include the introduction, research design, population and sample, instruments, data collection and analysis procedures, limitations and ethical considerations. And then after we go through all of the components of the chapter, we'll have time at the end for questions. So if you do have a question, um, as you are listening to the webinar, you can type that question into the questions section, but we will be saving answering the questions till the end. So any questions that you submit that are not answered over the course of the webinar, we can answer those during the question section at the end. So let's just start by talking about the purpose of the methodology chapter and why the methodology chapter is important to your dissertation. So the methodology chapter is designed to describe how you will be conducting your research. In the previous chapters of the dissertation, presumably the, the background introduction and literature review sections of your dissertation you are setting up your study and discussing why your study needs to be conducted. When you get to the methodology chapter, you begin to discuss how you are going to conduct the research. And the important thing to keep in mind with the methodology is that this chapter should be detailed enough so that your research is able to be replicated by others. So somebody should be able to read your methodology chapter know exactly how to conduct your study, and they should be able to conduct your study following your methodology chapter exactly as you are conducting the study. And while we will be discussing the typical components of the quantitative methodology chapter, um, based on our experience um, with different schools and students, these are the components that are most typical um, to appear in the quantitative methodology chapter, but it is important to double check with your specific school's guidelines um, or uh, degree program guidelines to determine exactly what sections need to be in the chapter. So that may be a little bit different from what we present today. So they may require more sections or they may require fewer sections. So you should always double check your specific guidelines to determine what exactly needs to be in the chapter. But now let's start by looking at the different components of the chapter and what needs to go into each section. So the, the chapter typically starts with a basic introduction where you restate the purpose or problem statement of the study and the research questions and hypotheses just to reorient the reader to the objectives of your study. And then after you state those, um, you can just give a short preview or outline of the sections that will appear in the methodology chapter. And this can be just as simple as listing out the different section headings that will appear in the chapter. 
And it's worth noting that when you restate your problem and purpose statements, that these, depending on what your school requires, you may be able to just um, repeat these verbatim from how they appeared in your previous chapters, or you may just give an abridged version of your problem and purpose statements. But for the research questions and hypotheses, these should always be stated verbatim exactly as they appear in previous sections of the paper. Your research questions and hypotheses should always be stated using the exact same wording throughout your paper whenever they appear. So after the introduction, you typically go into the, the research methodology and uh, design, so specifically the rationale for the research design. And depending on your school, this section may require you to just discuss the specific quantitative research design that you have chosen, um, such as you know, correlational, experimental, quasi-experimental, or causal comparative, or they may also require you to discuss the rationale for selecting the quantitative approach. So the quantitative methodology is the more general approach. So you might pick quantitative versus qualitative, for instance. But then the specific research design is what type of quantitative design are you choosing? And some schools may require you to discuss the rationale for choosing the overall quantitative approach and the specific quantitative research design, or they may just require you to discuss the rationale for the specific research design if it's just assumed that for your degree program, you're going to be doing a quantitative study. So for your specific research design, you want to explain why you selected that specific design. So if you picked correlational, you want to discuss why you selected correlational maybe because your research questions and hypotheses have to do with relationships between variables. And when you discuss the rationale, you want to tie it directly to your problem, purpose, and research questions and hypotheses. So you want to make sure that your research design aligns with your research questions. And then you may also need to explain why other specific types of research designs were not selected. So if you picked correlational, you may also want to discuss why you did not pick experimental or why you did not pick causal comparative. So for instance, if you're doing a correlational study, maybe you're doing correlational because it's just not possible for you to carry out an experiment to conduct your research or you may not be interested in comparing groups because the aims of your research involve just looking at relationships between variables. So those might be reasons why you wouldn't choose something like an experimental or a comparative design. And then going back to the issue of discussing the overall research method, you want to kind of go through those same steps if you are required to discuss the research method. So if you're required to talk about your rationale for choosing the quantitative method, you want to discuss why the quantitative method was chosen, why quantitative is appropriate, and you want to talk about why you did not select a different approach. So you want to talk about why you did not select a qualitative approach or why you did not select a mixed methods approach. Next, we'll talk about the population and sample sections. And this is the part where a lot of students can get confused because sometimes the difference between population and sample is a little unclear. But these are two separate things that need to be discussed. So first, the population is just the broad group of individuals that your results are intended to generalize to. So if you're, for instance, doing a study in nursing, your general population might be, for instance, you know, all registered nurses in the United States. So you want to state the population of interest, you know, for, for example, you know, registered nurses in the US um, or 
you know, if you're doing a study in education, maybe elementary school teachers in the US. Um, so state that general population. And then if possible, you'll want to describe the characteristics of the population and provide an estimate of the population size. This can be a little bit tricky to do because you know, if you're doing that nursing study, that means you have to try to estimate how many registered nurses there are in the United States. You might be able to find some statistics from sources like you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or something similar that might have an estimate for how many of those um, individuals in that profession there are. Um, so if it is possible for you to provide estimates for that, you want to do so in this population section. And then the sample is different from the population because the sample are the specific individuals that you will select from the population who will actually be participating in your study. So the sample includes the people, only the people who will actually be participating. So you can think of the difference between the population and the sample in terms of a fishing analogy. So if you're gonna go out to the lake to go fishing, you're not gonna try to catch every single fish in the lake. You might just try to catch a few fish. So all of the fish in the lake would be the population and then the few fish that you catch that day would be your sample. And so for your sample, you want to describe your sampling strategy or technique. So you want to describe how you are going to pick individuals from the population to participate in your study. And generally in a quantitative study, you want to select a sample that is representative of your general population. And the best way to do this is through random sampling, which is which means that every individual in the general population has an equal opportunity, be, opportunity to be selected to participate in your study. However, for most social science research um, and most dissertation studies, it's often not feasible or possible to do true random sampling from a very large general population. So a lot of studies will use a non-probabilistic sampling technique or convenient sampling, which is choosing individuals pop from the population based on you know, what groups of people are readily available and accessible to you. And like I said before, you will want to describe how exactly the individuals from the population will be selected and recruited into your study. So if you're doing that study on registered nurses, how are you going to pick registered nurses from the population um, to participate? Are you going to do something like find some kind of nursing association and then get a list of emails of members and send invitations to members? Or are you going to find individuals from that population some other way? Are you just going to go into some local hospitals and find registered nurses who work in those hospitals? You want to describe exactly how you are going to identify those individuals that you're planning to recruit. And crucially in this section, you also want to calculate and state your target sample size. And in a quantitative study, you will generally use a power analysis to calculate this. A power analysis is a way to calculate the desired sample size for a specific quantitative analysis. And the most common way to do this power analysis is to use a program such as GPower to calculate the sample size based on the specific statistical analysis you plan to do. Um, we won't go into a whole lot of detail about power analysis in this presentation, other than the fact that you will have to use power analysis in order to calculate your sample size, because we do offer other webinars specifically dedicated to power analysis and um, sample size calculation and quantitative studies. So if you are more interested in that specific topic, you can check out our um, webinars specifically on sample size.
And next, after you discuss the population and sample, you start to get into the more procedural aspects of your study. You might begin with discussing the specific instrumentation that you're going to use. So you want to state all of the instruments that you're going to be using to measure the variables that you're looking at in your study. So you want to make sure that for every variable that you have listed in your, your problem purpose and research questions, you need an instrument that measures that variable. And in a lot of social science research, this will mean that you're using some kind of a, a survey instrument. So there are different survey instruments out there that are available that measure um, different constructs of interest in the social sciences. So that's would be a common thing that you would look for um, are survey instruments that measure these variables. And so for each instrument that you have chosen, you want to describe that instrument in as much detail as you can. So for instance, if it is a survey instrument that measures some kind of construct like um, you know, depression or self-efficacy or transformational leadership, for instance, you want to state, you know, how many items or questions that instrument has, what are the response scales or scoring involved for that instrument. So are the, are the participants responding using some kind of a Likert scale, like a one to five scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree, or are they responding some other way? And you wanna talk about how those responses are scored. So if you're taking you know, a 10 item instrument, um, are you going to average those items together to get an overall score for the instrument or is the instrument scored some other way? And you also want to provide evidence for each instrument's validity and reliability. And some schools may even require a completely separate section in the methodology chapter to discuss validity and reliability. But if not, then this can be discussed in the instrumentation section for each instrument. And so for validity, you want to specifically look for evidence from analyses such as you know, factor analysis that discusses um, the instrument validity. And you would usually get this information from the original article um, that discusses how the instrument was developed and tested. And for validity, you might report the results of uh, a factor analysis, or you might re report uh, correlations between similar measures for that instrument. And then for reliability, you would typically report a reliability coefficient, such as a Cronbach's alpha, or you may also see something like a test-retest correlation to test reliability. And again, this information would be in the original article that discusses the instrument's development. Then after you discuss the instrumentation, you want to get into your actual data collection procedures. And again, this is a part of the chapter where you want to be as detailed as possible so that if someone else were to read your chapter, they could follow the exact same steps and be able to, to conduct the study in exactly the same way as you plan to conduct it. So you can think of this and really the chapter three as a whole as kind of an instruction manual or some people will even like it, liken it to a, a recipe where you want to you know, list out the steps that you need to follow in order to conduct the study. So you want to describe step-by-step step how you're going to collect your data. You want to talk about where and how your data collection will take place. So if you're, for instance, if you're doing a, a survey study, is this going to be an in-person survey? Um, so you might be going to a specific site and giving people paper and pencil surveys to fill out, or are you doing it as an online study where you just put your survey online and then you give the link to people and they can complete 
complete it at their, their own convenience. Um, you want to specifically state you know, where people are going to be um, and how people are going to be completing um, your study or participating in your study. You want to talk about how participants will provide informed consent. So whenever you're doing a study that involves human participants, um, you will have to get informed consent from those participants, which just means that you provide participants with information about the study before they agree to participate so that they may make an informed decision as to whether they should participate or not. And generally, you just give participants this information form that discusses the details of the study, um, you know, the risks involved in the study, what the participants will be asked to do. Um, this is called a consent form and participants receive this um, at the beginning of the study, they read it, and if they agree to participate, they sign the consent form. If you're doing an online study, often the consent is the consent process um, is you put your consent form on the first page of your survey. Um, you give them all of that information, and then the participants will just click an item on the survey to indicate if they um, understand all the information and agree to participate in the study. So you do want to detail that process. And you also want to talk about how and when each instrument will be administered. So if you're doing a survey study, for instance, and you're using multiple survey instruments to measure a couple different variables, then you want to discuss you know, in your survey in, in what order will the instruments be presented um, how the instruments will be presented. Um, and additionally, if you're collecting any other demographic information along with those survey instruments, um, when that information will be collected. So again, what this section really comes down to is just describing your procedures in enough detail so that someone else could repeat the same procedures um, just by reading your description. Then after you go over the data collection procedures, you want to discuss the data analysis procedures. So in your chapter three, you will want to form a plan for how you are going to analyze the data in order to answer your research questions and hypotheses. So you first want to describe how the data are going to be combi compiled or entered into an electronic format. Uh, this is especially relevant if you're doing um, in -person, uh, an in-person study or a paper and pencil survey where you have to take hard copies of the surveys and actually enter them into an electronic format. If you're doing an online study, then usually you can download the survey already in an electronic format from whatever you know, survey hosting service um, you choose to use to conduct your research. You also want to state the software that you're gonna use for the, the data cleaning and the analysis, you know, such as you know, SPSS. And you want to describe how you're going to clean clean and prepare the data for the analysis. So this may involve checking the data for missing values and for accuracy. And again, this is specifically relevant for if you had to manually enter in your data from you know, hard copies of surveys, because if you have to do that, then it's possible to make errors in entering the data when you're transferring it from you know, a hard copy survey into a spreadsheet format. So you want to check all the data to make sure that you didn't make any data entry errors, um, that there are no errors in the data. And you also want to assess uh, how much missing data you have, if any, and have a plan for how you're going to deal with missing data. So especially in survey research, you will inevitably run into a situation where you know, participants may not complete the entire survey. Um, they may not answer all of the questions. You can design your survey as best you can to try to make sure that participants 
answer all the questions, but a lot of times you're going to get back responses that are incomplete. I mean, maybe participants just decide they want to quit the study early. Um, maybe they just skip questions. Um, so you're likely going to have to deal with missing data. So you'll want to have a plan for how you're going to deal with it. So are you just going to drop participants who are missing data? Or are you going to try to keep those participants, but then replace the missing values in some way, such as a mean replacement or an imputation? You want to describe exactly how you're going to handle those missing data. Then after you go over the, the data preparation, you want to describe any descriptive statistics that you're going to be conducting on the data. So you would generally want to do descriptive statistics on any demographic information that you collect so that you can give readers a sense of the characteristics of your sample. And also descriptive statistics for the variables of interest that you're looking at in your research questions and hypotheses. And then you also want to describe the analyses that you're going to do to answer each of the research questions. So you want to organize this by research question. And for each research question hypothesis, state exactly what analysis you are going to conduct to answer that question. So if you have a research question about a relationship between two variables, maybe you're doing a Pearson correlation to answer that research question. You want to you know, state that you're going to do a Pearson correlation, state that you are, state the variables that you are um, examining for that research question. And you want to state things like the level of statistical significance that you're going to use and the specific statistics from the test that you're going to report. And for each test, you want to describe how the assumptions of that test um, will be assessed. So. For most statistical analyses, there are certain statistical assumptions that need to be met in order for the results of that analysis to be valid. So for instance, if you're doing something like a t-test, you may need to test the assumptions of normality and homogeneity of variance. So you would want to discuss how you're going to test each assumption and what you're going to do if any of those assumptions are violated. So next, we'll talk about the limitation section. And this is a section that may or may not be required. A again, it's going to depend on your specific school and degree program requirements. But sometimes they will want you to discuss the limitations of your research design. So it, you again, you want to go back to the specific research design that you chose and specifically discuss the, the limitations associated with that design. So for instance, in correlational studies, one of the main limitations is that you cannot determine cause and effect from correlational research. In survey studies, you may want to talk about different response biases like um, social desirability bias, for instance. And for studies that involve repeated measurements, such as a pre versus post study, you may want to talk about um, different threats to validity like attrition, testing effects, history, or maturation, or things that can affect people between the pre and the post measurements. And then for experimental studies, you may want to discuss external validity. So in experimental studies, external validity or the degree to which your results can generalize to a real world context um, can come into question. So you want to talk about um, limitations in terms of external validity for an experiment. And then finally, one of the last sections in the quantitative methodology chapter is usually the ethical considerations. And here, you just want to talk about ethical issues that are relevant to your specific study. And usually, schools will want you to talk about the Belmont Report principles, which include beneficence, justice, and respect for persons. And these are just standard principles that 
need to be met when you do research uh, with human participants. So a lot of times the school will want you to discuss each of the main principles, um, what those principles are, and how you are going to ensure that each of those principles are followed as you conduct your study. You want to talk about institutional review board or IRB approval. Um, if you're, again, if you're doing research that involves human participants, you will need approval from uh, an IRB in order to conduct your study. So you want to discuss how you're going to get that approval before you collect any data. You again want to talk about the informed consent process um, and how participants are going to be informed about the study. You want to talk about the risks involved in your study. And a lot of uh, students may make the mistake of saying that their study involves no risk. But you should never say that your study involves no risk because all studies involve some kind of risk. Even if it's a very simple online survey study, it does involve some degree of risk, and even if that risk is minimal. So you may want to discuss your study in terms of um, is your study only a minimal risk or does your study involve more than minimal risks? And especially if you fall into that second category, if your study does involve more than minimal risks, what are you going to do to minimize those risks and protect participants as best as possible? You want to talk about how participants' identities and personal information will be protected. So again, if you're doing a survey study, are you collecting any personally identifying information from participants like names or, or email addresses or any other information that could personally identify somebody? If so, how are you going to protect that information? Or, are, or is your data collection going to be completely anonymous and you won't be collecting any personal information at all? Regardless, you wanna talk about how the data are going to be kept protected. So if you are storing your data in an electronic format, how, is, how are those files going to be protected? So are you going to be storing them um, in uh, cloud storage that is you know, password protected or encrypted? Are you just going to be storing them on a personal computer? If so, how is that going to be protected? Are you going to use password protection? If you're collecting any physical copies of data, such as paper and pencil surveys, how are the physical copies of the data going to be stored and kept secure? Um, are you going to be keeping them in a secure location? You want to provide those details. And then once the study is over, schools will typically have guidelines for what you should do with the data um, at the conclusion of the study. And you'll want to discuss how you will be disposing of the data once the study is over. So a school might tell you that you should keep the data for you know, anywhere from three to five years um, after the study is concluded. And then at that point, you should destroy the data. So you'll want to talk about that process, how long you're going to keep the data and how you're going to destroy the data when the study is completed. And so that brings us to the end of the presentation. So that covers all of the typical components of the quantitative methodology chapter. And again, here is some information um, to contact us in case you are interested in additional one-on-one -on -one support uh, outside of these webinars. And with that, I will get into the uh, questions. So I'll see um, what questions. Um, you may have here and do my best to answer those. And one person said, uh, talked about uh, power analysis and yes, we do just to, to reiterate, we do um, offer a, a completely separate webinar dedicated to power analysis. Um, so you can either check out uh, recordings of our past webinars on that topic or sign up for a future webinar. Um, that covers power analysis and sample size calculation. And one question is, will session be done at some stage on validity and reliability? So we don't have a, a current webinar series that's 
that is specifically dedicated to validity and reliability. Um, that I mean, that's something that we could consider doing a, a specific webinar topic um, on in the future. Um, but currently, we do not have a, a, a whole webinar dedicated to it. Um, like I said, for validity and reliability in quantitative studies, typically you're going to be using instruments that have already been developed by previous researchers. So you often will not have to do your own tests for um, validity and reliability. Rather, you will just have to discuss the validity and reliability of the instruments that you plan to use because presumably those instruments will have already been developed and vetted for validity and reliability. And from there, it's just a matter of finding that information. And like I said before, you usually find that validity and reliability information in the instrument development article itself. So the article that talks about how the instrument was originally created Usually for a quantitative instrument, they would do something like a factor analysis to establish validity. And then they would do some kind of reliability coefficient like a Cronbach's alpha to, to, to establish reliability. So the information that you'd need to put into your chapter three would be taken from the, the statistics that they report for those tests uh, in that original instrument development article. And the next question is, is the type of sampling chosen for a study critiqued, for example, a probability sampling technique would have added rigor to the study if accessing the sample was a possibility instead a non-probability uh, technique that was used? Uh, yes, um, and you do have to, or you may have to rather, to some extent, provide some rationale or justification for the sampling technique that you choose. Again, in quantitative studies, a, um, a probability-based sampling technique like random sampling is ideal because it um, gives you the best chance to have a sample that is representative of your population, which is typically a goal in quantitative studies. But you know, for the purposes of dissertation research, often it's gonna be the case that it's just not going to be practical or feasible for you to do a, a random sampling strategy or technique. So you may have to rely on some kind of non-probability sampling technique. So in that case, you may want to describe why it is not practical or feasible for you to do true random sampling and then discuss what you will be doing instead in justifying that specific uh, sampling technique. And the next question is, are the ethical considerations the same if you have uh, not human participants but are using data? So I think you may be referring to using pre-existing or uh, secondary or archival data, um, in which case you, know, you still want to discuss ethical considerations, um, but it'll be a little bit different than if you're collecting primary data. So you still want to talk about you know, how you're going to keep the data um, secure and confidential if you're using pre-existing data. And this is especially the case if you are you know, getting the data from some sort of you know, organization or data administrator who keep that data confidential themselves, um, but will share it to you know, students like you for the purposes of conducting research. Um, so typically, in that case, you know, there may be a process that you have to go through with that specific organization or data administrator to get access to the data. And you may have to, you know, um, agree to some terms in terms of you know how you're going to use the data and keep it secure. So you might talk about that in your ethical considerations section. So um, 
another thing that you may want to talk about in ethical considerations with that is um, ethical considerations in terms of how the original data were collected. So that could be another um, thing that you could talk about in that section is, you know, were you know, ethical procedures followed in the original collection of the, the data? So the, the short answer to the question is yes, you still have to talk about ethical considerations to an extent, even if you aren't collecting primary data. Next question is, let's see here. Question is, do you have recommendations on writing up archival uh, survey data? So yeah, your chapter three will be written a little bit differently if you are using all archival or pre-existing data. Um, you will want to talk about specifically how you are going to get access to the data. So you'll want to describe that process. So that can go in your data collection procedures. And you may also want to describe the process for how the original data were collected. So there should be documentation or, or something from you know, the, the researchers that originally collect the the data and you may want to summarize or discuss um, how the original data were collected just to give your reader an idea of um, where that pre-existing data uh, came from. And Another question is, if a study is a mixed method study, would you include two separate sections for chapter three? The short answer to that is no, but we did recently have a webinar that was specifically dedicated to uh, a mixed methodology chapter three. Um, and so you can go back and look at um, that previous webinar that we did to get more specific advice on how to um, Dis discuss and list out the different sections for a, a mixed methodology. And let me see. We do have a lot of questions um, that people have submitted here, and I'm going to try to get through them as best as I can um, in the time that we have remaining. So let me just go through and see what more we have here. Question is, let's see. What is your opinion on providing incentives for survey participation? Does this impact the validity of the research? Um, that's a good question. And you do, um, if you do plan to provide incentives, you want to discuss that in your methodology chapter and be as specific as possible. So if for instance, if you're going to pay people to be in your study, you know how much are they going? Are you going to pay them? If you're going to compensate them in some other way, how are they going to be compensated? Um, it's okay to provide incentives, but you do not want to provide undue incentives that may be considered coercive. So, for instance, you know if you're just doing a survey study that um, takes a couple minutes you don't want to provide an undue incentive like pay someone $100 to complete a 10 minute survey. Um, that's probably too much and might um, kind of coerce people into participating in your study when they may not have otherwise wanted to um, participate by providing some kind of you know, um, undue uh, incentive like that. Um, that's the, the main kind of ethical issue that you want to consider when doing an incentive is you do not want your incentive to be coercive in any way um, because you do not want to provide, provide something that would make people feel pressured into participating in your study when they otherwise um, uh, would not be able to or would not want to.
me see what other questions that we have here. Uh, one question is, uh, do you provide assistance for creating surveys on Qualtrics? Uh, you can um, use our contact information here to get in touch with us and learn exactly what assistance we provide. But as part of assistance that we provide with results, we do often um, help with putting surveys uh, into Qualtrics. Um, we, we typically do not do things like um, assist with the actual data collection or recruitment, but we um, do sometimes help with just putting the, the questions into Qualtrics so that you can send out your survey. Um, but again, you can use the information on your screen to contact us and learn more about the assistance that we can pro provide with uh, survey hosting. And a question about the best way to determine validity and reliability if you're developing your own survey instrument. Um, and so if you do have to develop your own survey instrument, again, the, the test that you typically do for validity would be something like a factor analysis. Um, and then reliability would be Cronbach's alphas. So, it would be a similar process to what you would see in an article for an instrument that has already been developed. You may also have to do pilot research um, to, to pre-test your survey and then do some tests for validity on your main sample. Um, and really, uh, some schools may not even allow you to um, create your own instrument or develop your own instrument, but if that is something that you need to do for your specific dissertation study, um, you would just have to be prepared prepared to you know run those specific validity tests yourself and maybe have to do some pilot testing in order to do that instrument development. And let's see what else we have here. Okay, so I have a question talking about um, 300 participants, um, half in a control, half in a test group. Groups given a pretest, mid test, and a post test. Goals to determine improvement for um, a group which received training versus a group which had no training. So, this sounds like in what methodology to use. So, I mean, you would be using a, a quantitative methodology. So, that's the general methodology. And then the specific research design. Um, it sounds like it would be either experimental or quasi-experimental, depending on how exactly you are assigning the participants to those groups. So if you are using random assignment, um, so you're using a completely random process to put people in group A versus group B, then that would be an experimental study. If group A and group B are already existing or you are not assigning participants to those groups randomly, then that would be a quasi-experimental design. And let me see other questions we have here. Uh, question is, does the Belmont report and IRB apply to research that does not use human participants? Uh, the answer is, um, it can be yes and no. The Belmont report um, is specifically geared towards protection of human participants. Um, generally, 
but even if you're not using human participants, and, and this may be something like if, you know, if you're using archival data or if you're using non-human animals in research, like you're doing some kind of um, you know, study like, like lab rats or other non-human animals doing that kind of research, um, you would still need to go through um, an IRB process to get approval for that research. You know, depending on exactly what type of research you're doing, for instance, if it's archival, you might go through some expedited process um, because you're not collecting primary data, so there are fewer risks involved. Um, but you still would have to go through an approval process. Um, your school still does have to examine the, the procedures that you're proposing um, to make sure that they are sound and ethical. Um, and approve those before you actually collect the data. So the short answer is yes, you still do have to kind of discuss IRB and ethical concerns, um, even if you aren't studying human participants specifically. It's just that those concerns may be a little different compared to if you're doing a, um, a primary data collection study with human participants. Then a question is, what factors make a research methodology weak? So I think maybe you uh, are referring to limitations um, of the, the methodology, which I mean, we can go back to our limitations slide um, and discuss those a little bit. So there are limitations associated with specific research designs, and there may even be limitations um, that are more specific to the, the procedures that you choose for your specific study um, that you may need to discuss in the limitations section. Um, but the general limitations of these research designs, um, again, for correlational studies, the, the, the big one is that you can't determine cause and effect. You can only look at um, the uh, relationship between variables there are a lot of uh, limitations to survey studies in terms of um, response bias and things like that. If you're doing any kind of repeated measurements study where you have you collect data from people at multiple points in time, um, there are a lot of limitations or factors that can affect validity, like people dropping out, which is attrition, um, you know, testing effects, history and maturation, which can um, affect how people react to subsequent measurements um, other than the whatever treatment um, you're implementing in your study and so on. Um, in general, for the general methodological approach of quantitative versus say qualitative, the, the main weakness of quantitative research is that you don't really get um, in-depth information about um, people's experiences um, with these, the specific topic or the phenomenon that you're, you're looking at, which is what qualitative research is designed to examine. With quantitative, you're really just you know, putting all the data that you're collecting into numbers and running statistical tests to see you know, if there are statistically significant relationships, are there statistically significant differences, um, those kinds of things. But you can't really get a really good in-depth examination of you know, why do people feel this way um, or, or other you know, sort of subjective measures that you could only get at with a qualitative study. So the main limitation of the quantitative method is the depth of the information. Um, you don't get quite as deep a level of information as you would get if you were conducting a qualitative study. And a question is what processes are involved in the phenomenological research from data collection up to data analysis. If you're talking about specifically the um, phenomenology qualitative research design, um, 
this presentation is only for quantitative um, methodologies, but we do have um, a, a, a webinar series dedicated to the qualitative methodology. So if you're interested in specifically um, phenomenology and what's involved in the data collection and analysis procedures for that specific design, I would encourage you to check out our webinars um, on the qualitative methodology. And we're getting close to the end of our hour here. And I think I've gone through all of the questions um, that were for this topic. And let me see, maybe you have a few more here. A question is, does one always need to describe hypotheses and do hypothesis testing or are there cases when not? Uh, that's a good question. Um, for quantitative studies, it is very common. Um, and you know, depending on your school, it may be expected or required for you to have hypotheses that you are testing. Um, that's sort of the basis of most statistical analysis is based in null hypothesis testing. So a lot of schools will require you to actually state those hypotheses and, and test those specifically for a quantitative study. Um, but other schools may not necessarily require you to write hypotheses. They may just require you to write research questions. But it's important to note that even if you just have to write research questions and you aren't required to write a hypothesis, you still want to make sure that that research question aligns with the, the quantitative method and the specific quantitative um, design that you are pursuing. Because you wanna make sure that this, when you conduct the study and collect the data, um, you're able to do an analysis that answers that specific research question. And a lot of times having specific hypotheses will help make that a little bit more concrete because it'll help you give or give you a better idea of what specifically needs to be tested and what statistical analysis you should conduct to test that hypothesis and answer that research question. But the short answer would be, you know, there, there are some cases where you may not need hypotheses, but for quantitative studies, generally you should have um, hypotheses associated with your research questions. And it looks like that was all of the questions um, that have come in. And we're now at the end of our hour. So I'm going to go ahead and end the session there. Um, again, if you are interested in more one-on-one -on -one help, uh, please feel free to contact us so you can you know, learn more about the services that we offer. And if you are interested in you know, the other webinar topics, you, you can check out our webinars, see what other topics we offer to get more information on those topics. And also, you know, we'll be holding, you know, this webinar on qualitative methodology again in the future. So, you know, if, you know, you want, you know, even more information on or discussion uh, on this topic, we will be holding this webinar again um, down the line. You can look at our webinar schedule to see uh, what webinars we're going to um, uh, offer soon. So I would encourage you to check those out. But um, so this is we'll where we'll end the session today. Um, thanks everyone for uh, attending. I hope you found it useful and I hope everyone has a great day.